The last viewing assignment I gave you was a documentary, Jim Bifola, which traced the homeward journey of Jim Bifola Mamadi Keita to his home village in Guinea after an absence of a quarter of a century. In that documentary, you heard a great deal of extraordinarily complex music. In this lecture, I'm going to try to explain some of that complexity, and I'll do so with the help of some music from Ewe culture in Ghana, some 2,000 kilometers east of Mamadi's Guinea, but nevertheless close enough to share a good deal of cultural expression, including music. The comparison should therefore prove useful and instructive. One of the questions I asked on the quiz over that film had to do with Mamadi's observation that a djembe fola is not only someone who plays the djembe, but someone who can make the djembe speak. In a related comment, he indicated that there are over 300 Malinka rhythms, and what he was talking about was not musical rhythms, but rhythms, inflections, and so forth of the Malinka language, one of a family of languages spoken over a wide swath of Western Equatorial Africa. Put those two things together and you begin to get a sense of his meaning. He was referring to the tradition of drum language, which could be defined as the vernacular meaning of a drummed phrase. Vernacular, of course, refers to the language spoken in a given region. As you've listened to my lectures, and in fact, as you listen now, you may have noticed that there are some fairly predictable patterns in my speaking, not just my word choices and the way I string them together, but also in my delivery. There is a rhythmic quality to it, and this quality is generated by the types of words I'm using, where the accents fall within those words, and how those words relate to the rhythmic context of the whole. Along with those rhythmic patterns, which could be notated using the standard symbols for note duration, my delivery also includes rising and falling inflections, which could be approximately notated using the symbols for musical pitch. And if you will think about your own way of speaking and that of your friends, I think you'll notice similar rhythmic patterns and inflections. You have no doubt encountered people whose speaking is difficult for you to understand, not because of the words they're using, but because their rhythmic and inflective delivery is unfamiliar. This is, of course, true for all languages, and the music of the world's many cultures, not surprisingly, tends to reflect those language patterns. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that in so many of my descriptions of musical construction, you'll hear me invoking grammar and syntax, either directly or indirectly. Now, imagine how a really skilled drummer, drumming with his hands and thus able to apply selective pressure to the drum head to create rising and falling inflections, might be able to imitate on his drum the sounds that are coming out of your mouth. That imitation is the essence of Mamadi Keita's description of his drumming art, making the djembe speak. It's not difficult to imagine why such a practice would exist. After all, long before the advent of electronic communications, it was often useful to be able to communicate over a distance farther than your voice could carry. So how have people solved that problem? Well, if you live out on the Great Plains of North America, you might become adept at sending smoke signals, as a number of Native American tribes did. But of course, while that would work in the vast open spaces of the central North American continent where you can see forever, it would have no effect at all in the forests of equatorial Africa. For places like that, you'll need to be heard. And that is why drum language, sometimes referred to as talking drums, evolved. To prepare you for a discussion of this, I'd like you to listen to a brief excerpt from a performance by Ewe musicians. This is one of their Agbekor performances. <laughs>
Did that music sound to you anything like the music that you heard in the film Jimbifola? I hope the similarity struck you because it really is a powerful resemblance. And I hope that excerpt was sufficient to give you some idea of the richness and complexity of texture of the music we're about to explore. But before I can talk about that complex texture, I need to give you some idea of what this music is about. First, this recording was made during a performance that goes on for hours, a performance that involves a great deal of drumming, singing, dancing, acting, and so on. If you were to see such a performance nowadays, what you'd be witnessing is a cultural reenactment, and it might remind you of that performance by the Joliba Ballet that you saw in the film. This music comes from a time when the Ewe were politically autonomous and not, as they are now, citizens of the nation of Ghana, mostly. Before there was such a nation as Ghana, the Ewe would, from time to time, find it necessary to address territorial encroachments by a rival tribe, the Fon, with the response often taking the form of war. Since the Ewe had no standing army, when such contests were deemed necessary, an Agbekor troop would go from village to village where they would stage a splendid performance basically meant to work up the passions of the villagers and get them eager to fight the Fon. In other words, it was basically a military recruitment tool. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's kind of a nutshell description of it. The drummers who were involved were playing complex polymetric music, which they produced by means of a continuous recycling of rhythmic patterns, all of which had a meaning in the Awe language. In other words, each drum stroke corresponded to a syllable in a spoken phrase. Those short phrases that the drummers were playing all had something to do with fighting an enemy. Over this complex rhythmic substrate, the singers would sing about going to war. Both the conscious and subliminal effects must have been absolutely amazing. Just a moment ago, I referred to complex polymetric music. You no doubt remember recent quiz questions about metrical profile, which always has to do with how many beats there are per measure. With that in mind, the word polymetric surely must have something to do with more than one way of dividing a measure into constituent beats. Well, we saw an example of that earlier in the Victor Hara song, El Aparecido, during verses that exhibited three beats against two for each of its measures. I called that sesqui altera metrical rhythm and pointed out that it's a version of polymetry. Polymetry is the presence in music of more than one meter simultaneously. Three against two, as you heard in El Aparecido, is a simple version. Four against three, which is the case with this Agbekor music, is much more complicated, especially when the drum language rhythm patterns, the patterns that fit into those multiple meters, are themselves so complex. More about that in a moment. Listen to that short excerpt again, try to get it in your ear, and then we'll talk about how it's put together. Let me introduce you to some musical instruments. The Ganko Gui is a double bell played with a stick. The larger bell is twice the size of the smaller, which means that the two bells are an octave apart in pitch, with the smaller bell, of course, being the more high-pitched of the two. Whoever is playing the Ganko Gui is essentially the leader of the ensemble. Next comes a rattle unique to Ewe culture called the Ahatse. Traditionally, this would have been made of a dried gourd about the size of a cantaloupe with seeds strung around the periphery of the gourd on a fiber net, a seed at each intersection of the net. Nowadays, the net is usually nylon and the seeds have been replaced by glass beads. 
Striking or shaking the rattle causes those seeds, or beads, to vibrate against the body of the rattle, producing its unique high-pitched sound. Here are four drums used in the Agbekor Ensemble, from highest to lowest in pitch, Kaganu, Kiri, Kloboto, Todotsi. In the drumming lesson that follows, courtesy of Jeff Todd Titan's Worlds of Music, we will hear those four drums played in that order. This breakdown of the patterns begins with the Ganko Gui, whose player, as I mentioned earlier, is basically the leader of the ensemble. The pattern you'll hear is a complex syncopated pattern in broad triple time, or you could divide it up into twice faster beats and get six beats per measure, your choice, because it really comes to the same thing. The playing is done mostly on the high bell. The pitch drops regularly to the lower one, however, just for one short stroke, then returns immediately to the high bell to begin the pattern again. If you can listen to it this way, and count to three fairly slowly, I believe you'll be able to discern the triple meter behind it. Now we're going to hear those several instruments one at a time together with the Ganko Gui part. You'll get a measure of Ganko Gui before the other instrument enters. That should make it easier to do what I'm about to ask you to do. First up is the rattle, the ahatse. What you should do as you listen is ask yourself, do these patterns fit comfortably together? I'm not asking if they're the same pattern, which they certainly obviously aren't but rather if they're like two different hands that could fit comfortably into the same glove, the glove representing triple time. Listen and see if you can do that. I hope you could tell that the fit was very comfortable. So although we so far have a rich assortment of rhythmic patterns before us, those patterns fit comfortably into broad based triple time. So we are not in polymetric territory yet. Next comes the high pitched Kaganu. Do these parts fit together comfortably or not? I'll let you decide. I hope you didn't have any trouble figuring out that there's a kind of conflict there. Both those parts were not in the same meter. In fact, the repeated pattern you heard on that drum fits a meter that involves four beats per measure against the Ganko Gui's triple time, which must mean that the drummer's beats, not his notes, but the beats those notes fit into, are faster than those of the bell player. Yet they agree on the downbeat, which they strike together, and which is their only direct point of correspondence for the entire measure. No wonder the music sounds complicated. Next up is the Kiri. What do you think about this fit?
you may have noticed that the pattern played by that drum was three high notes followed by three low ones, with that sequence repeated continuously throughout the excerpt. That pattern does not fit the Gonkokui's meter because the pattern works out to four sets of three notes each within each measure. In other words, a flowing version of quadruple time known as 12-8. In other words, this drummer's pattern fit the pattern played by the Kaganu and both are in four beats to the measure compared to the Gonkokui's and the Hatsi's three. Next up, the Kloboto. I trust you could tell that there was no tension whatsoever between those two parts, which means that the Kloboto is like the Gankogui in broad three. And finally, the Tototsi. Again, I trust the comfortable fit between those parts was evident. So that means that among those six players, we have four of them playing patterns that fit three beats per measure and the other two playing in four. So what is the effect when you put all of that together? Well, I'd describe it as kaleidoscopic. Listen and tell me if you think that's a good description. What you've just heard was an explanation of how the rhythmic substrate is constructed. And the reason I called it the rhythmic substrate is because there's a lot added above it, so to say, not actually physically hovering over it, but rather independent and shifting around a lot compared to this absolutely consistent music that's kept going throughout the Agbekor Vololo, the broad paced Agbekor, represented by the excerpt I played earlier. I want to play that excerpt for you again, and this time, in addition to the singing, I want you to notice what some other drummer is doing, a drummer who is apparently responding to the singers more than to the other percussionists, and whose playing is very free and flourishing. While you were listening to that, did anything come to mind that you saw in the film Jembefola? Do you remember all that solo drumming that Mamadi Keita was doing, which he described as freely wandering? In fact, he said of an ensemble of drummers who were doing something very much like what you heard in that drumming lesson, they're very strong, they never miss a beat, I can wander at will in my solos with them. That's the arrangement you hear in this performance. 
That drumming you just heard that didn't have anything to do with the other percussionists was drumming by the solo drummer, who was playing a drum not unlike a djembe. And of course there was also the singing, clearly a call and response arrangement between a solo singer and the chorus, with the calls and responses often being of different lengths and character. This all adds up to some really extraordinarily complex music, polyphonic music, a polyphony based in polymetry. Now it's time to hear the music in its entirety. I have for you three excerpts from a field recording, the first of which is the broad-paced Agbekor that I've been introducing you to. In this excerpt, we hear a couple of songs sung continuously, voicing such sentiments as children of the noble homes, get the things ready, and be cunning, the day has come, beat the double bell, the day has come. Next comes very different music. The six-member percussion ensemble goes silent, and it's down to the singers and the solo drummer. This song is divided into two parts, differentiated by an exhortation from the solo drum. It begins with another call and response between the singers, who praise the prowess of the Ewe people, comparing them to the waves of the mighty ocean. Then, following the solo drummer's exhortation, the focus shifts to the enemy, the fawn, who are denigrated in the lyrics of this song. They are dismissed as hornless dogs, surely a metaphor for impotence. <laughs> Nahira Hadama, Yonu, Nahira Hadama, 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 Nahira
At this point, I want to insert an observation that I think is important. One of the reasons for studying history or anthropology or psychology, especially evolutionary psychology, is to help us avoid making some of the mistakes that earlier generations or earlier cultures have made, or failing that, at least shedding some light on why we make the mistakes we do. Cultures are so different, but humans are humans, much more alike than they are different. In the song you just heard, you may have heard an echo of something familiar. If you're getting yourself psyched up to go punch someone in the face or don a uniform, pick up a weapon and go fight an enemy, you have to do two related things. One, you're going to have to convince yourself of the virtue and rightness of your own cause. And the other is, you're going to need to be able to see the enemy as somehow less worthy of life than you. This is, of course, what propaganda artists specialize in. Have you ever seen any of those World War II posters printed in the United States that depicted the Japanese people as something subhuman, animalian? Those faces were made to look as much like those of rats as possible while remaining recognizably human. Is there really any difference here at all? And speaking of the mistakes humans seem to make over and over, the last portion of this field recording gives us a sterling example. Here, the music returns to full ensemble, to a fast and furious pace, and the singing raises the whole conflict to the cosmic plane, as the singers inform their audience that when we meet the fawn on the battlefield, we will not be alone, for our gods will be there fighting alongside us, as will those of the fawn. In other words, we're about to find out whose gods are greater. Here's the excerpt. Again, that has a familiar ring to it, doesn't it? Jean-Jacques Rousseau trenchantly observed during the 18th century that no army yet has taken the field under the banner of agnosticism. And if Rousseau were alive today, he'd have to acknowledge that that has not changed in the two plus centuries since. In other words, people always fight their battles in the name of God, even imagining that they're doing the will of God and that God is surely on their side. That's what the German legend Gott mit uns means, the motto that German soldiers wore into battle on their belt buckles during World War II. 
Well, was God on their side? Was God on the side of the godless Soviets, of the capitalist Americans? Whose side was God on exactly? It seems that everyone claims him. Perhaps there's a lesson to be learned in that. I want to take you through a quick review of what I've introduced you to here, and will then close with a potent cultural reminder that should bring some important things into focus. We've been listening to music of the Ewe people, who can mostly be found in the modern nation of Ghana. The music comes from the Agbekor tradition, a kind of military recruitment tool used by the Ewe whenever they found it expedient to go to war with the Fon, their traditional enemy. Fon, by the way, is spelled simply F-O-N, in case you want to look it up. We heard three excerpts from an Agbekor performance, starting with a section called Agbekor Vulolo, or broad-paced Agbekor. The music involved a percussion section of six players, including the double bell called Gankogui, the unusual rattle known as a Hatse, and four drums of varying size, pitch, and timbre, which means tone quality. Those percussionists played an unvarying outpouring of complicated rhythmic patterns in two different meters. Those patterns all represented the tradition of drum language, that is, each of those patterns actually means something in the Ewe language. Those patterns are played repeatedly, hundreds of times, over and over during a performance. The playing of a short melodic or rhythmic pattern over and over is called ostinato, as I hope you recall from previous lectures where the same thing applied. Much of African music is based on ostinato and could be described as layering, that is, one pattern superimposed on another and so forth, with all the patterns moving together in musical time. That served as a substrate to the performance, a very complicated substrate, extremely busy in texture, which I described as kaleidoscopic. If you've ever looked through a kaleidoscope, I think you probably understand why I described it that way. This would be a good thing for you to keep in mind, by the way, because in the next lecture we're going to meet some polymetric music with a very different texture, and I will refer back to this music for comparison. So, over that substrate provided by those six players, singers in call-and-response configuration sang some admonitions to get ready to fight the enemy, while a solo drummer embellished the whole in a very free, flourishing way, similar to Mamadi Keita's performance with corresponding musicians in Guinea, well over a thousand miles away. As I said, the field recording you listened to was broken into three parts, with parts two and three used in a way that should be familiar. That is, part two was aimed at building up the courage and will of the Ewe people while denigrating their enemy the Fon. And part three raised the whole thing to the cosmic plane with the claim that the gods themselves would be out on that battlefield with them, fighting alongside them. If you've read the Hebrew Bible, this is surely a familiar notion. It is, in fact, a situation that seems to have prevailed at least ever since the rise of agriculture and organized civilized life, fighting in the name of one's gods, sure that God is on one's own side, not that of the enemy. This seems to me a tragic and dangerous way to think, and I often wonder if there's any way out of that trap. To set this music in a worldwide context, I'll point out that polyphony of any kind is relatively rare in the world's music, which is mostly monophonic or homophonic. There are apparently three places in the world where great polyphonic traditions have arisen, and equatorial Africa is one of them, the other two being Europe and Indonesia. I'm going to close this lecture now by once again making reference to the great difference in worldview between hunter-gatherer people and people who are engaged in agriculture. If you are a hunter-gatherer, you do not grow your food. The earth grows your food for you. 
This is why the earth is commonly regarded as a benevolent mother by foraging cultures and a resource to be exploited by agricultural ones. Until very recently, the Ewe, like most equatorial African tribes, have been hunter-gatherers, and their worldview is that of hunter-gatherer people. And now I have a short paragraph I want to share with you from Jeff Todd Titan's Worlds of Music that lays out the Ewe religious worldview, and I will ask you to consider it. Here it is. A traveler in Anlo is struck by the predominating, all-pervasive influence of religion in the intimate life of the family and community. The sea, the lagoon, the river, streams, animals, birds, and reptiles, as well as the earth with its natural and artificial protuberances, are worshipped as divine or as the abode of divinities. The implications are profound. How does this align with your worldview, with the worldview of any agricultural industrial civilization? Can you see anything useful in this worldview, anything to recommend it to an exploitive culture that's imperiling its own continued existence by mining, plowing, polluting, and fishing the world to death? What do you think?